All right, uh, today we have a very special Zoom with Dr. Max Spendler. Um, I met Dr. Spendler about two years ago at the International um, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day at the Dallas Holocaust Museum, at Dallas Holocaust and Civil Rights Museum. They had some really cool displays that day as well, not just about the Holocaust, but civil rights movements and things like that. Um, he is a hidden child of the Holocaust, which means he was hidden by his parents uh, in an orphanage, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. So that uh, because they could tell that, you know, the climate was shifting and, you know, they wanted to protect their children. Uh, he has a little brother also. How much uh, younger was your little brother? He is four years younger than I am. Four years younger. Yes. But anyway, um, Dr. Uh, Spindler came to my classroom a couple of years ago and spoke to my kids and um, told his story. Uh, and obviously he is a survivor and his brother is a survivor. And they walked through some very difficult times. But what I hope that you learn from this man, that you get from this man, is that it doesn't matter how bad it gets you can still overcome and you can still become a huge success just just wait till you till he tells you all the things he's been able to do all right uh dr spindler it's yours and i'm gonna share the screen and pull up the website very quickly here and okay. just let me know when you're ready for me to share the pictures okay uh so um, let me tell you something about myself. I was, uh, I made an outline and I'm going to try to follow the outline as best I can. Uh, first of all, I was born in 1938 and in 1939, about, uh, la less than, uh, one year later, the Germany invaded Poland. And that started uh, World War II in Europe. Did not include America until America came into the war in 1941 when the Japanese uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. But uh, Germany then invaded neutral Belgium in 1940. And in Belgium, once the Germans got established, they required all residents to have their credentials checked. And Jews had to have theirs stamped in red letters in both French and Flemish. And that says, Jews. Now, you may have that picture of the ID card. Um, it's this one here, the little one. The sec, the sec, oh, here it is. So that's my father's ID card. And it says both in French and in Flemish that he is Jewish. Um, in 1942, the Germans started to round up Jews to be sent to France to work on the coastal defenses. Those that were unfit for work were sent to concentration camps in Poland and exterminated. So when the Belgians found out about that, they resisted the further deportation of Jews from Belgium. Um, and that wasn't the government so much as the people themselves who felt that the Germans were barbaric in their treatments of their people. Now, you got to understand that my parents, who had immigrated from Poland to 
Belgium prior to the war in the early 30s were not citizens of Belgium. Belgium had a rules and regulations, just like we do with regard to uh, people in Belgium. You cannot become a citizen except if you are born to a citizen. So we were, uh, my, my parents and I, we were legal residents, even though I was born in Belgium and my brother was born in Belgium, we were not Belgian citizens, but we were uh, legal residents of Belgium. Um, but after the first roundup of the Jews in 1942, most went into hiding with the collaboration of uh, Belgian organizations. Um, and uh, organization and institutions such as the Catholic Church and then some other non-religious organizations. My brother was born in September of 1942. And in 43, at the age of four and a half, I and my brother were sent into hiding. Now, one of the people that helped get us into hiding was Andre Goulin. Um, you may have her picture. Uh, can you quickly? Is it this one? Was it the two uh, ladies or is it one of the yeah. single ones? Uh, the, lady, the lady who stands to the left is Andre Goulin. And the lady to the right is Ida Sterno. Um, they were both working in the underground. Uh, André Goulin is a Catholic individual and Ida Sterno is Jewish. Uh, notice that Ida Sterno is not wearing the yellow Jewish star on her, uh, on her frock. And that is because in many municipalities, uh, the Belgian government would not allow them to wear the yellow star. Even though the Germans insisted on it, somehow or other, the populace helped the Jews not to put on that yellow star. So they could not be easily identified and therefore could continue going to work while they were hiding. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, my bro uh, so this lady there, uh, uh, the Andre Gulin brought me to one of the orphanages. I was four and a half at a time, and my brother was placed in a pouponniere that is a, that's French for nursery at the age of nine months. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to find where I am. Okay. I dropped my papers. All right. So during the time that I was in orphanages, I was shuttled to different orphanages. I believe that I was in about four or five different orphanages. Um, and I was constantly being shuttled from one orphanage to another because they wanted to keep my identity hidden. In other words, I w no one was supposed to know that I was Jewish. 
just in case they made surprising visits at some of the orphanages and one of the other children might say he is Jewish. Even though uh, I was given a hidden name, so here I am, I'm, uh, my name was Jacques Ledon, which is a very French name. Um, uh, Belgium is divided into two parts. One part is French speaking, and another part is Flemish speaking. Now, Flemish is a dialect of Dutch, okay? But it is written the same way as Dutch is. So, um, Jacques Ledon was a French name. Uh, even though I had been brought up in a Flemish area from my earliest childhood. Um, but again, I was shuttled from one orphanage to another. And uh, I remember them because of various incidents. Like the first orphanage I remember was the one where I was in my sabot. Now, sabots are wooden shoes. And many of us kids had wooden shoes. And I didn't have any socks on either. And there, this was in winter, okay? So, and most of us kids did not have any socks. So we, we were in our uh, wooden shoes and we were sliding down a hillside in the courtyard. And, um, so that was kind of a happy time, but that's one of the first incidents that I remember. Um, the other incidents that I remember was when I was uh, happily lying on my back in a grass on a hillside and that was at a different orphanage, totally different one. And uh, I was looking up at the sky, looking at the cloud formations. And all of a sudden, I'm called in for dinner. So I, I got very, very upset because somehow or other, I remember that incident, I was especially happy lying on my back watching the clouds sailing by in the beautiful sky. Um, the reason why I recall those incidents is because life was extremely dreary in those various orphanages. Quite often we didn't have enough food. Uh, there was no entertainment. Uh, Life was just humdrum from day to day. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I remember that. Then I remember another incident, which was visitor day. Now, the orphanages in Belgium were not uh, just for orphans. There were children there whose parents uh, either could not afford to keep them or who had lost a parent and the other parent could not cope by themselves. So they sent the children to the orphanage. And I seem to remember that we were at times as many as 70 uh, boy orphans in the orphanage. Uh, in some, we were less, like about 40. Um, but I do remember a visitor day. So people would come to visit either their uh, children or their uh, kin. Uh, it could be cousins or uh, nephews whatever the situation was, but I never had any visitors. And I recall once asking 
why I do not have my parents come and visit me. And they said, they never told me that my parents had died. So I, or that they had been deported. So I was always hoping that one of these days, my parents would show up. And I remember many a time going to bed and crying and hoping for uh, my mother. Um, at any rate, um, what happened on this particular visitor day I was by myself in the courtyard. All the other children were with uh, parents or relatives. And one of my friends pointed me out to one of his relatives. And uh, they beckoned to me. So I came on over and he introduced me as his friend. And then they asked me to share with them some of the goodies that they had brought for him. And what it was, it was sautéed green beans. Now, you may not think that's a real nice goodie. I mean, after all, it is a vegetable. And you know, we don't eat vegetable, right? That's a poison. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was truly delicious. And the reason why they brought those vegetables is because food was extremely difficult to get. And uh, well-prepared food, um, especially difficult. So however they sauteed it, it was really delicious. And to this day, sauteed green beans are one of my delights. However, it doesn't seem that I can get the taste as I remember it. All right, so that, that was one of the incidents that I remember at one, in, at one orphanage. Another incident was when the radar foiling streamers came out of the sky. And the, uh, those, were, uh, those streamers were to foil the German radar from locating American aircraft and uh, the various bombers. Um, it would fall the German radar. Uh, so that, that was at another orphanage. Another orphanage I remember was one when we had a celebration on a particular saint's day. And we boys were all arrayed in a hall, a passage, a, a passageway between two major halls, and um, uh, we were fed uh, with an especially good meal, and we were seated on benches, and uh, one of uh, one of the boys uh, picked up the salt shaker and shook it into, into their soup and, uh, and then mixed it, uh, uh, mixed it with the soup. And I asked, what was he doing? Because I had never seen a salt shaker before. There was, this was something brand new. We normally did not eat with salt shakers, and, but they were put out because of a celebration. And uh, so I tried it. And it really made the food taste very good. Uh, then they served us a sweet compote. Uh, which is like a dessert, uh, it's a dessert, it's a fruit, uh, fruit dessert. And uh, I remember reaching for the salt shaker, shaking it into my glass of sweet compote, 
and then stirring the contents just like I had done with the soup. And the glass broke. So I was summarily dismissed from the proceedings and the celebration. The other boys laughed at me because they thought it was strange that I put the salt into a glass of compote, but I had no knowledge of not doing those things. Um, so uh, I was dismissed from the proceedings. I was about five at the time. Um, and uh, so those are the incidents that I remember. Uh, then finally, um, I remember being brought to the very last orphanage in Ostend. And in Ostend, the nuns took us almost daily to the beach in summer. Uh, and if we weren't going to the beach, we would walk to the dunes and play in the dunes. Uh, those of us who had uh, uh, buckets and little shovels would play in the sand, would bring them with us. I had nothing because uh, I had no family to bring me anything but I played with the other boys. And I remember in this particular orphanage, when one of the boys was going away, um, he was leaving the orphanage, he donated to me his pail and shovel so that I could have my own. And, and that, that's one of the bright incidents that I remember at that orphanage. Um, again, that was the very last orphanage. So in 1947, I was about nine years old. I finally was told that for visitor day, I would have somebody come and visit me. And I asked if it was going to be my parents. And they said, no, it will be someone else, but you'll be very happy to meet them. Okay, so I waited for visitor day. And on visitor day, I was called into the office of the orphanage and uh, met with two strange people, elderly people, and my brother. Uh, who had, and at the time I did not know he was my brother. But they introduced themselves. They were Mr. and Mrs. Abras, and they were uh, the guardians of my brother. They asked me at the visit that I should call them uh, Mr or Mrs. Abras when I addressed them. So it would be Monsieur Abras or Madame Abras for Mr. Abras and Mrs. Abras. Uh, but my brother I could call by his name, Gerard. Um, and uh, they said that we would meet once again. So my brother and I, we embraced and uh, they took us to uh, to a restaurant, the first time I'd ever been to a restaurant. So, um, and they took us by taxi to a restaurant. Um, one of the places they took us is shown in one of the pictures here where I am with my brother. Can, can uh, you find the picture? Yes, this one. Yes. So, okay, so that's in December of 1947 
when I am nine years old, I am the taller of the two. Uh, notice that I am in shorts, and this is December, and there is really snow on the ground. You cannot see it from the picture because it's somewhat faded, but there was snow on the ground, and I'm wearing a girl's frock uh, or coat. Um, remember that all of the clothing was pass me downs because I had uh, no one to give me anything. And the boy on the left is my brother. Now, what you'll notice is that he's got a big curl running from the front of the head to the back of the head. And he's got a little fur coat. Um, in those days, that was one of the styles for young boys. Uh, they had long hair and they had a curl that uh, mothers would uh, affix to their hair. You know, that's the way they fixed their hair. Um, and uh, I was promised that we would meet again after the departed. Now, I met with them again in. Uh, 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 in at Easter at Easter break from school, and uh, went to their house um, in um, uh, Namur, uh, Jamb Namur. Jamb is a suburb of Namur, one of the big cities in in Belgium. Um, and uh, I had a real fine time. Uh, with my brother uh, over at their house. Now, they had a little garden uh, at their house, and they had uh, pear trees and uh, apple trees in their yard. Um, uh, they had a rabbit hutch, which they used for food. Um, and uh, I remember my brother, once showing off to me, uh, but that, that was at a later time. I'll tell you about it now, though. Uh, showing off to me uh, by picking up an earthworm out of the garden and eating it. And uh, I was scared for him. And uh, so I went uh, to Mr. Abras and told him about it. I said, uh, my brother just uh, ate an earthworm. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, it's perfectly okay. It turns out that during the war, this was after the war, of course, but during the war, people ate whatever they could. And earthworms uh, are high in protein. So uh, they ate earthworms in addition to raising their own rabbits. Um, in, um, in, the, in the summer of that same year, I came again uh, to visit them. And uh, I had a fine time. Uh, I remember an incident where um, uh, my brother and, and my brother invited me to come into the field at uh, at a farm where they were visiting, uh, and uh, so he wanted to introduce me to some cows in the field, and uh, I went into the field and uh, we were walking towards the cows when suddenly a bull came running towards us. My brother started to run towards the fence and I ran after him. And then when we got to the fence with a bull very close to me, he couldn't climb up. But because I was taller and bigger, I could help him. So I helped him over the fence and then I got myself over the fence just before the bull got there. Uh, the Abrasus called us 
and told us to never go into the field again without their permission. Um, that, so that was in summer of 48. Come winter of 48, I was not invited back to the Abrastos. And uh, that was rather unusual because they wanted to have me for uh, their holidays. So I stayed at the orphanage. Uh, but you may wonder why is it when they wanted me and I was eager to go and visit my brother, I could not go. So I will tell you what happened the following uh, Easter break came Easter break and uh, I went to visit my brother. At that point, uh, on the day before I was supposed to go back to the orphanage, uh, the Abrasis called me in and my brother um, and uh, told, told us that on the morrow, we were supposed to go and uh, walk to the park in the middle of the street. There wouldn't be any traffic. It, was a sun it would be a Sunday. That's a church day. People would be walking to church. And we were supposed to walk to the park. Uh, and a taxi would come by. It would stop. And a man with the name Uncle Maurice would come out of the taxi and would, would, and would take us and we should go with him. So uh, we agreed to that. And uh, that's exactly what happened. On the morrow, we were dressed uh, as if we were going to church. And, uh, uh, but then we're asked to go and walk to the park, which was about two blocks away. Um, and uh, on the way to the park, uh, a taxi came by and a man came out and uh, he uh, introduced himself as Mr. Uh, as Uncle Maurice. So we know, uh, we knew that we were supposed to go with him. And he took us to his home in uh, Brussels. Uh, we stayed there for the night, and the next day he brought us, uh, 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 he brought us to another orphanage. And that was a Jewish orphanage. Although on that day that he took us, he showed us around Brussels. Now Brussels is famous both for its Grand Place, and he had taken us to the Grand Place, which is the town square and has beautiful ornate buildings. And then there is also the little statue of Menneke Piss, which is world famous. And that's of a little boy that is standing, minding his own business, and people from around the world uh, sent clothing. So the, the little statue of the boy is constantly being redre redressed every day, and he's got more suits that any of us put together. Uh, all right, so uh, I went to the Jewish orphanage uh, with my brother, and the Jewish orphanage was totally different than any other orphanages I had ever experienced. For the one thing, there weren't as many people. And the other thing is, there were girls also at the orphanage, and we ate in common at a table, boys and girls, 
in family style, a large table, but family style. And um, uh, we slept, we, uh, we, we had games to play. Um, we went to school, um, which I'd also done uh, finally at the orphanage. And, um, um, but in our rooms, uh, after school, after we had done the homework, we were allowed to play with various toys. This is something that I was never able to do at any of the previous orphanages because we didn't have toys that I can remember. Uh, and we were only about a maximum of four boys to a room. Uh, uh, that, that's to the best of my memory. There may, it might have been as many as eight, uh, but I, I seem to remember four to six. Um, one of the nice things is that we were allowed to have our own personal possessions because I had none, but all the boys did have, have somehow or other had some possessions and they shared. So that was, that was kind of nice. Um, in the Catholic orphanages, I was always in a large room in a big dormitory. And just being like that in a relatively small room with four to up to eight people was kind of very personal as opposed to the impersonal dormitory that I had been in the other orphanages. So it was kind of a pleasure. Um, I went to school there, um, and uh, one day at that uh, Jewish orphanage, I was told that I would be going with another counselor, my brother and I, and we're, we were hidden in the attic uh, behind some old mattresses. Uh, way in the back of the attic. Uh, we stayed there for two nights. Now, I do remember uh, that somebody opened up the attic uh, entryway and shone some flashlights uh, into the attic, and from the rafters, I could see the light. Uh, being shown um, on the rafters, and then uh, the doorway being closed. And I stayed in the attic an additional day with the counselor. We were brought food over there. We had uh, mattresses with bedding. Um, and uh, uh, two days later, I rejoined uh, the group, but I did not go to school. Later in the week, at the end of the week, we did go back to school. Now, what was happening is this, that my brother and I, we were ward, wards of the church. and we had been so-called kidnapped from um, our guardian and uh, from my brother's guardian and uh, by an individual whose name was Uncle Maurice. I found out all of that information later on. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you uh, how uh, the history, how we found out about all of that information and what I did in the meantime uh, and about my parents. 
um, we were, uh, I have a very good friend of mine who has a cousin in Belgium. And uh, she was able to get me in touch with the cousin. And we visited it, the museum at the Rosin Barracks in, in Mechelen. That's a city in Belgium from which they reported the Jews to concentration camp. And uh, we found out that they had three articles that uh, my parents had left behind. Um, and they were, they were kept in archives in Belgium. I could retrieve them if I wanted to, and I eventually did. One of the items that I retrieved was my father's ID card, the one where I showed you where his ID is, uh, uh, where he's labeled as uh, being Jewish. Um, the Germans were very meticulous with their, with their records. And they kept records of what was going on with what they did. So in, you, you will see, uh, not only did I get my, uh, my father's ID card, but I also got my mother's ID card. I'm not showing it here. But here is a record of my parents. If you can go to the second from the right, I believe. Uh, no, that's my father's ID. No, go. go um, the list on the yellow paper. The one, oh, that's the list. Yes, with the yellow paper. You can see uh, the deportation order and on what uh, transport my parents were deported to Auschwitz. Uh, like I said, the Germans were very meticulous in keeping records. And when uh, they were driven out of Mechelen, they left their records. So we were able to reconstruct and find out that my parents were deported on such and such a transport for which we have records uh, on April 4th, 1944, which is uh, slight about uh, a year before the end of the war um, but it was the next to last transport oh no there were three okay there were three two more transports after my parents were deported had they had they been had they been left a little bit longer they might have survived but uh, neither of them survived the war. Now, um, uh, if, if you can, I will sequence, if you go through the pictures, I will relate, relate to you some items. So um, can, you, can you flash through the pictures? Okay, that, that is a picture of the records that the undergrounds kept of me and my brother for the entire time that we were that we were in hiding it's uh, one of the notebooks that uh, uh, andre gulin had kept and it indicated where on um, uh, where we were going and where they took us from. In other words, from my parents' home 
to a particular location uh, and what our ages were. So we were able to reconstruct based on that what exactly had happened to us. This is, this is just the beginning of what had happened to us. Um, uh, also, when we were at the museum in Mechelen, we found out that the Belgian government had kept dossiers on each of its residents um, during, uh, prior to the war. And therefore, I was able to locate family of mine through those dossiers. Um, if you if you now sequence the pictures, since I cannot see uh, which they are, uh, yeah, that one, that is one of my cousins. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, pardon? No, that's not Rochel. Uh, that's um, I'm getting a bad moment here, uh, memory-wise, but uh, oh, Chaya, that's uh, my cousin Chaya. Uh, I never got to meet her. Yeah. Now, the next picture to it is another cousin. That is my cousin uh, Rochele, and uh, she, is about 16 at the point. And shortly thereafter, uh, or uh, two years after that, of course, she was picked up by the uh, Nazis and sent to deportation camp. So I lost three aunts and uh, three uncles with about six cousins that were sent to concentration camp and never came back. Um, my uncle Maurice, he was really not an uncle. What it was is during the time of when they, uh, of the deportations and when they were rounding out Jews, uh, trying to ferret them out of hiding, um, he and some friends had gotten together and they agreed that if anyone would survive, they would bring, uh, after the war, they would try to bring the children back into the Jewish community. And he, this Uncle Maurice, survived the war, survived concentration camp, and came back to Belgium in 1945 after the war and started looking for us. But he could not find us. He finally was able in 48 to locate us. He found out how he, I'm not sure how he found out, but he found out that I was at an orphanage and that my brother was with the Abrasis and uh, the Abras and Hans went to the Abrasas and told them the story of the agreement that he had made with my parents. Um, and they did allow my brother and I to be picked up by him and brought back into the Jewish community. So this is the story um how i got back into the jewish community now um uh 
I think this is a picture of my parents prior to the war. Uh, notice my father is natally dressed and my mom is uh, in the high fashion of the time. She was a furrier um, and, uh, and my uh, father was a tailor and uh, apparently there was a good type of job to have at the time. So they are probably out on a Sunday stroll. Um, all these pictures we were able to obtain from the dossier. Uh, this one is not from my aunt. Uh, this one we were able to obtain from a dossier that the police have kept um, of the family um, during the uh, prior to the war. Um, let's see. Can you sequence to some other pictures, and I'll try to explain what was going on. There's only one more picture here, and it's uh, this one that was the, I guess, the other side of your father's paperwork. Oh, okay. I don't have any other. All right. Okay. All right. That that's fine. So I'm done with the pictures now. Um, so I have, um, what had happened is because of the dossier that the police have kept prior to the war on the residents of all foreign residents of Belgium, uh, I was able to reconstruct my family's history in Belgium. And uh, uh, I found out that my mother first came to Belgium, then my father. They met in Belgium, married, and of course had us children. Um, um, in 1949, because we were in the Jewish orphanage, and really none of us had any parents. Uh, and any possibilities for growth in Belgium, they sent the entire orphanage to Israel. So Israel had just, the prior year had just, earlier that year had just signed the armistice agreement in May of that year. And in October of that year, I came to Israel with the orphanage. And there I really started my uh, education. Starting, I was then 10 years old. I started again, first grade. Now, I've got to tell you about first grade. I attended first grade four times. Three times in Belgium because I was moved from one orphanage to another and I did not know what was going on. I was always behind the curve and had to restart first grade. Um, the last time I restarted first grade was um, uh, in Belgium, where is when I was brought to the Jewish orphanage. By that time, I was already, I, I think, in second or third grade in the Catholic orphanage. But when I got to the Jewish orphanage, they must have tested me and decided that I was incompatible with a higher grade. So I had to start first grade again. And after a while, they thought, well, he should be able to move higher so they tested me and they asked me to add and i remember uh something unusual because at the jewish orphanage we were learning proper french 
at the Catholic orphanage, we were learning colloquial French. Now, there is a difference. The Belgians in their colloquial French, when they say 80, they say uh, 420s, 80, which is 80, or uh, four score, okay? The same way as uh, Old English would do it, four score. But to say 90 in French, in Belgian French, we say 90. In proper French, you say 90s, that is four score and 10. So if you want to uh, say 95, you might say, uh, you might say four score and six uh, and 15, all right? But I was not aware of that distinction at the time. So when I was called uh, for the, to be tested on my math skills, they asked me to add uh, 70 and 96. Now, 70 has the same problem in French, in proper French versus Belgian French. In Belgian French, we say septante, which is just 70. In proper French, you say 60 plus 10. In, a, in other words, soixante dix. And when they ask me in proper French to add 60 something with uh, 90 something, I didn't know what they were talking about. I'd never heard that before. So I failed the test. So I went sent back to first grade. Yeah. Okay. So when I came to the st- uh, when, when I came to Israel, I had to start first grade again, and I, fin- I was there three years, and I finished third grade. When I came to the States, my aunt, to my aunt, my aunt uh, wanted to bring me to first grade again, but the uh, elementary school uh, principal would have nothing to do with it. So instead, they moved me to eighth grade. I should have been in ninth grade. But why did they move me in eighth grade and not ninth grade? Because they felt that it would spoil my high school record. If I had any capability whatsoever, I would, uh, uh, I would, it would be well for me to do well in high school. So I started with eighth grade, had to learn English. When I came to the state, I had no language in common with my aunt and uncle. Um, So I had to learn another language, which apparently they figured I must have spoken with my parents. Then I started to learn English. And um, um, I I did very well in eighth grade, even though I had language problems. Um, By ninth grade, I already had made the honor society and uh, went on to complete, went on to college and get my degree in engineering, then went on to graduate school and got my master's and my PhD. Okay, now I'm available for any questions you might have. All right, Um, guys, I'm gonna ask you to kind of raise your hand on the screen and I will come around to you. Um, uh, Keep in mind, I got three screens going here, so you may have to be patient for me to get to you. All right, Um, I'm gonna, Jonathan, did you have your hand up? Okay, I'm gonna unmute you. 
All right, go ahead. So my question is, how did your brother's guardians find you in the first place? It's through the church because um, the, um, we were both wards of the church. Since my parents had given us in hiding to the church, the church were responsible for us. And they kept records. Uh, so they united us. And another question? Anybody else have a question? Please raise your hand and let me know. All right, let me find you. Hold on, here we go. There you are, right here. Go ahead. Brother, uh, like go back to the States with him? Uh, I'm sorry, where is that? Can, would you please repeat? Did, did your brother go back to the States with you? No. When we got to Israel after about a year, the International Red Cross, they have a service uh, that uh, is in charge of reuniting families. And they were able to get family that I had in Israel together with some family in the United States, united. In other words, uh, uh, there were three, my, my parents were, were uh, my father was one of 10 children, only three of which survived the war. Two aunts in Poland, uh, okay, uh, I'm not going to give you the whole story on how they survived the war, but uh, two of them eventually managed to make it to the United States, and one way before the war went to Israel, which was at that time British Mandate Palestine, um, where, where she um, uh, where she uh, established her home and uh, she was able uh, with her husband to take my brother in from the orphanage in Israel. I stayed in the orphanage and the reason for that is they were not well enough off to handle two children. They could only handle one child. And my brother was the weaker of us two. So they decided to take in my brother. He also had not been used to living in an orphanage. He was not doing very well in the orphanage. He didn't, uh, it, it, it didn't suit him very well. And I was used to orphanage life. So he remained with that family, with that aunt in Israel, and I came to live with my aunt here in the States. And he still lives in Israel to this day. I talk to him now weekly uh, via WhatsApp. Um, that's kind of nice. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, uh, Deja, you had one. Never mind. Okay. Okay. Um, right here, um, Heather. Is your brother still alive and do you have contact with him? Oh yeah, well, yes, I talk to him weekly. He's younger than I uh and uh 
um, we we speak in Hebrew, uh, basically weekly. He speaks some English, uh, but my Hebrew is better than his English, so we decided to speak in Hebrew. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, Ms. Starr, go ahead. I'm sorry, was that a question for me? Uh, Ms. Starr, um, I'm trying to unmute her. I don't know if she can hear me right now. Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, Dr. Spindler, <laughs> my son has a question and I have a question. Um, he wanted to know if the man who picked you up at the park and took you to another orphanage uh, was really your uncle. And my question was if, were there a lot of children, Jewish children, who were saved in the way you and your brother were? Or was that rare? Um, no, there were, um, uh, first of all, let me answer. The first question, he was not my uncle by blood. And that is why the church would not allow him to take us. Because only blood relatives by law were allowed to reclaim the children. He was just my father's best friend. Um, and um, so they did not allow him. Now, did it happen to a lot? Yes, there were a lot of hidden children. Uh, approximately 10,000 hidden children in Belgium. Um, some of them, the parents who survived, knew where they were and came back to claim them. About 50% of the, of the Belgian Jews survived the war. So, and that is a very high percentage compared to Holland, where only 10% survived. And the reason was, is that the Belgian authorities and population were very keen on helping its Jewish residents and citizens. There were Jewish citizens as well as uh, Jewish residents. Um, so they were keen on resisting the Nazis and on um, hiding the Jews. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, Faith, I'm trying to unmute you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, and, I and I like your red hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if, when you were in the orphanages, did you know if any of the other children were hidden children or not? Uh, if there were other Jewish children? Um, the answer to that is no. I did not. And I was, um, I was constantly shuttled about. And probably one of the reasons why I was constantly shuttled from one orphanage to another is that we were supposed to be, our Jewishness was supposed to be kept secret. For example, I'll give you a, a situation. Uh, we had weekly, over here we are relatively lucky, and that is that we shower uh, daily and we clean ourselves daily. Over there, we used to, at the orphanage, we used to take sponge baths, okay? But weekly, we would go into the shower. And the nuns were very careful that we all put on 
uh, when we undressed, we went individual into a little cabin or a, 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 a little closet, whatever you want to call it, and got undressed in that closet and we put on bathing suits uh, or swim trunks. Okay. And the reason, for, and then we went into the tub or the shower. And I think one of the reasons is number one is modesty, but uh, number two is they did not want to identify individuals because Jewish children were circumcised and uh, Catholic children in Belgium were not circumcised. So you could identify somebody very quickly, but not in a swim trunk. So, those, so I did not know who else, if there was anybody else that was Jewish. Uh, Ms. Highnote? Yes, I was, I was wondering about your brother. Um, did he ever get to see the couple that had raised him? I forgot their names, the Dersads, or yeah. did he get to see them again? And did he, if not, did he oh, miss yeah. them? I'm sure that was hard for him. It was extremely hard for him because they had brought him up mm -hmm. from the time that he was 18 months old until he was six years old. And as far as he was concerned, he had, they were his parents. He had thought they were his parents. He did not know otherwise. Um, he had an older brother. The older brother was their 30 year old child at the time the Abrasis 30-year-old child. So you know that they were, they were considerably older uh, than we were. Um, the son had been picked up by the Germans and put in a um, POW camp. So um, when my brother was, 18 months old, he was dying. And uh, the uh, pouponier or the nursery where he was uh, went through the underground, were looking for a family that were willing to take on a, a dying child perhaps to re to revive him because he didn't want to talk he uh, he didn't want to eat he was just at death's door and mrs abras worked as a nutritionist in a pouponier so she agreed to take him on and she had to feed him with an egg, uh, with a eyedropper. She, um, she told me, she told me years later that she fed him with an eyedropper. What she had done is, you know, where, where I had gone, uh, when we had gone in summer to visit some of her family at a farm where the bull tried to attack us. Well, those people also had chickens and they had eggs and she had gone to visit them and bring back eggs from the farm because eggs were contraband. The Germans would, uh, would not allow eggs to be sold uh, on the economy. So, if you got the eggs, you either got it on the black market or you got it from family. And if they caught you with eggs, it was not good. 
but she was able to obtain eggs from her family on the farm, and with those eggs, she would feed him until and, and nursed him back to health. Now, he did not completely uh, come back to full health. I mean, physically he's fine, but he does have a stammer, a stutter. I'm sorry. He he does have a stutter. And to answer your question, we had been in touch with them from the time I had been in touch with them uh, from the very beginning because I wrote to them uh, whenever I could. I wrote to them in French and continued writing in French both when I was in Israel and when I came to the States. Uh, uh, and my brother, when he grew up, he went back to, uh, to Belgium and visited with them on vacation. When their uh, two, when they're every other year, or every third year, because uh, Belgium, from Israel to Belgium is uh, uh, very easy to get to and very inexpensive. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Spindler, um, if you could, I'm gonna ask you a question that you can kind of address to the kiddos a little bit. You know, they're, you know, they feel like sometimes this is a little overwhelming and it's a little, um, it's a little scary being told that they can't go to school right now and that they have to stay home. And, you know, so they're, they're kind of going through a very minor glimpse of what you went through in your life. Um, would you give them some advice uh, and some encouragement for just how they might handle the situation that they're in right now? Well, uh, I know that it is a very difficult time for all of us. I myself cannot go to the grocery store. My significant other, uh, whom you've heard in the background, uh, goes uh, to the grocery store for both of us. And uh, it's difficult to be home, but you know, it will come to an end. And we, we have it relatively uh, nice because we can go to the grocery store. We do have entertainment through TV. We do have our radios and we have our cell phones where we can communicate with friends. So however hard it is not to be together with your friends, you know that eventually this thing is gonna be over with and you'll be able to go back to school You'll be able to meet with your friends. Uh, and there is hope out there. There is a lot of hope. Uh, I heard today, for example, that uh, they've come up with a medicine that they've been trying that seemed to have posi positive indicators for the coronavirus. That uh, it has helped people who were on uh, the breathing apparatus to come off of it. So uh, there is hope. There is a lot of hope. And you know that perhaps eventually they'll have a vaccine. It seems promising. We were uh, I don't know what it, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
you know, I don't know what I don't know what else to say. Uh -huh. uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. I do remember uh, uh, a, a a scene when I was four four years old, where I was in a single room in hiding with my parents and there was a little baby in a crib uh, in the corner and all of us were in a living in a single room while i was hiding our circumstances today are far better than that Definitely. So there is hope. There is. All right. Uh, we're going to take one last question from the kiddos here. Um, Abigail. Hi. Um, I'm actually Abigail's mom. My name is Anna. Um, the question is from me. Pardon me for uh, jumping in over my kid to ask questions. Um, I wanted to know if you um, have ever gone back to visit um, places like Auschwitz and, and the things that are um, there now to memorialize the people who suffered in the Holocaust. Uh, I have never been to Poland, so no, I have, I've been to various uh, in Belgium, I've seen some memorial to the people who have died from Belgium, uh, but I've never been to Poland. I, uh, I cannot, I break out, uh, you know, uh, whenever I, I, I see what, what happened. Uh, so that I can't, I can't go to Auschwitz. Uh, uh, Ms. Castro, is there anything that you'd like to share? No? Okay. Um, I tell you what, uh, we have just a small surprise for you. Um, if you ladies and gentlemen would open up your cameras, those of you that can, and that made your signs, and you will hold those up. We're gonna just have those up there for him just for a couple of minutes here. Um, these kiddos worked really hard to make some We Remember signs. Oh, and thank you. We're gonna get I these up on the screen. Appreciate that. And you guys, I need yeah. you to get them all up and get your, your cameras open so that I can get a shot of the oh. other screen with everybody on there. So just yeah, China. I'm, I'm, scroll, I'm scrolling through the various screens. Wow, thank I'm you. I'm recording it, so I've got to get everybody up on this screen, and then I'm going to change it to the next one so that we can get that, and I can get the screenshot off the video. Some of you are very artistic. Oh, yeah. There we go. All right. You guys, uh, get your signs up there. Miss Rabbits. Yes. I didn't make one. I forgot. It's okay. Um, if you didn't make one now, you can Same. make one later. And what you can do is um, when we go um, to the Padlet, and uh, Dr. Spindler, I will share the Padlet with you later so that you can see what some of their reactions and reflections were. Um, and on that Padlet, if you'd like to, you can make. Okay, please meet your mics, guys. Uh, you can make your sign, you can take your picture, and you can put it on that Padlet. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Grant, Ms. Desso, any of the other teachers that are here, do you guys have any questions that you want to ask or any comments that you want to make before we kind of let Dr. Spindler have his evening back? I just want to say thank you for spending your time with us and for enlightening us on the experience. I know that the students are that have been very engaged as I've watched them, and I know that they're very interested. And we just we appreciate you, and we appreciate you taking the time to share an experience such as this with us. So thank you. Well, yes. I feel I feel honored 
to be asked by Janita to talk and I and share my experiences and I hope that we all remember that human rights are important uh, that we will survive this and ooh, what a pretty dog <laughs> uh, we'll survive and we'll come out smiling at the end of it all yes sir we really really appreciate you taking this time I personally appreciate this and I'm sending you a big giant socially distance hug here you know um, I think everybody's sending you a socially distanced hug um, and I'll hold I'll hold back he, he does he he is a great hugger he is a wonderful hugger um, what we'll do then is we're going to let you have your evening if you would like to stay and um, see what they're going to do with the other assignment that they're going to have with this. You're welcome to stay and hang out with us, but I'm going to show them their Padlet so that they know what to do to go there and what to do. And I will also share that link with you so that you can go on there and respond if you want to as well. Okay, well, I'll I'll. I'll stay on for for a little while. All right. Okay. okay I'm going to share the screen then, and I'm going to okay. show you guys the Padlet. Uh, the Padlet is right here. I'm going to go over that assignment with you really, really quickly. Um, let's let me move this down a little bit. All right. It says, "Dr. Max Spindler, hidden child of the Holocaust." says, please take a moment to reflect on the time we spent with Dr. Max Spindler and the story of his life that he shared with us. Remember that when you write a reflection, guys, don't forget, you restate, you reflect, and then you relate. Restate it by writing it in your own words. Uh, find something he said that inspired you and write that in your own words. Then you reflect on it. That means you ponder or you deeply think about it. And then you write what you think is meaningful. And then the last part of your reflection, you relate to it. You find a connection that you have with his story. It may not be an exact connection, but you might go, oh, oh, I, I, I feel that. I understand that because of this thing that happened to me. Uh, your reflection should be about three to five sentences. And if you would like to do so, you can upload a pic of yourself holding your sign, your We Remember sign. Um, very quickly, let me... Um, let me, let me shrink this a little more. Um, the pink plus sign is what you click to make your post. Where it has the title, please put your first name and your last initial. You do not have to put your entire last name, just your last initial. Where it says write something, that's where you're gonna write your reflection. You can either use your device and click on the camera to upload a picture of you, or you can take a picture and then upload the file. And if you don't remember how to do a reflection, I put our little anchor chart right here that says restate, reflect, and then relate. So that gives you guys just about all the information you would need uh, to get there. The link is on the website. Uh, let me make this small again. The link is on the website right down here. I'm sorry, I had to move everybody. All right. Uh, your reflection Padlet link is here. And then this is also a Padlet. It just has information that you can read there. But um, Ms. Starr, you, are, you and your students are absolutely more than welcome to participate on that Padlet as well. I would love to see what their responses are. And um, adults in the room, you are also welcome to participate on the Padlet and upload your picture and write your reflection on there if you would like to do so because we will definitely be sharing it with Max and he is absolutely welcome to also be a part of it and write some notes on there himself. Thank you, Ms. Moravitz. Uh, my kids, I've, I'd love for y'all to participate with that. So I am going to also, thank you. All right, and you thank you, Dr. Spindler, this has been uh, Blessing. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Say thank you. Thank you. George, uh, thank you for 
joining us and I've enjoyed the experience in meeting some of you on, the, on these uh, pictures. Uh, you, you kids are really smart that you can manipulate all the technology. Uh, I <laughs> certainly uh, had not been exposed to that the extent of that technology that you people and you are young that you are able to handle <coughs> i think it's remarkable all right well dr spendler we appreciate your time um i'm gonna let you guys go and as you go i'll in the meeting here in a few minutes, but um, guys, make sure that you are reflecting when you go to that Padlet. I really wanna see some good responses. So um, kiddos, I will see you Monday. Hey. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Guys, we miss you. you all so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. One person starts everybody eating. <laughs> <laughs> on you. I know it's like a giant Brady Bunch. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Feel free to hang out if you would like to stay for oh, a minute sure. and ask your last minute questions. Uh, but kiddos, thank you so much. And I am so proud of your behavior. You have no idea. I'm so proud. Of you. I do have a question. Who's yeah. that? me i wrote something in the cross it's in the language that you it's in a jewish language so yeah it's, i got it from one of my mom's friends ah that's hebrew what you see there in the in the star in the star of david it says shalom that's Hebrew for and hello and goodbye. <laughs> I just kind of found that interesting. So, do you think that was worthwhile, Jonathan? Huh? Well, yes, sir. Um, when you say, um, you know, peace, uh, in English, if you look, if you read some old English literature, when you say hello, you would say you come in peace. And when you go goodbye, you'd say go in peace. So we have a similar attitude in English historically yes all righty all right well, love you guys i hope you guys Thanks enjoyed so this uh, the adults can hang out for a minute but um, well y'all just yeah miss desso you got anything i just joined no I can't say anything. Christian, mute your mic, buddy. There you go. Uh, Mr. Grant, did you have anything? Yeah, I had one question. What uh, profession did you go into after you finished school? Uh, I, um, I'm, uh, I got my PhD in civil engineering in uh, hydraulics and as soon as i finished school i went to work for an aerospace company i stayed that for a number of years for about three years then went to work at the university uh, back in my field of hydraulics and hydrology in civil engineering so i was on the teaching staff at the university 
Yes, yes. All righty. Well, we, um, we do seriously appreciate your time. And um, we really love that you were able to come and do this with us. Um, I know that I personally am so appreciative. You have no idea. Um, I really enjoyed your first visit, but I think this one, I'm sorry we couldn't be in the same room, but I think this one might've been even better. Well, but, um, I do appreciate your time and I will definitely um, send you the link. Well, you've got, you have the um, website already, so you can go to the Padlet. It's right down there in the, in the um, website link. Okay. Okay. You can uh, go and you can take a look at what the kids had to say and you can put your own things up there if you'd like to. Um, more pictures if you have them, you can upload a picture to the little um, note or whatever you would like to do there. But we do appreciate your time and I am so, so very thankful that I met you that day. I really, mm -hmm. really am just, I feel completely honored and privileged. Well, the privilege is mine of meeting people who care and uh, uh, are continuing to learn because it is important for us here in the United States as well as the world to maintain our civil rights and know what happens when there is abuse of civil rights. Exactly, exactly. Okay. All right, I'm gonna let the kiddos know that if they have any questions that they did not get to ask, that they can put them on that Padlet and you can answer them on there. Okay, Is that and I'm not gonna sign off. All right. Okay, all right, Thank bye. Thank you so much, you have a good evening. All right, you guys um, go ahead and unmute your mics. Y'all can unmute Hello. your mics now. Did y'all hear me, Commissioner Rabbit? Did I hear you? No, you never unmuted your mic. Oh, I did unmute it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. Well, we can put it in here. Or you can put it on the Padlet. I really appreciate y'all coming. I hope y'all really enjoyed it. I know my age. I know my age. Aaliyah, what did you think? Did you? Huh? Uh, Aaliyah? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it still says Leah. I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. You guys can go to the Padlet and do whatever it is that you need to do there. Um, and participate with us on that. Yes.